Hello, hello. All right. Um, so, uh, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I want to thank the organizers and the committee and staff. Um, uh, this is my first time here, so I'm reading some notes. Um, and it's a, really an honor to present here. Um, it's really a dream come true for my undergrad self, so, um, and it took a while to get here. So I want to thank um, all the support that uh, people from this institution and other institutions have given to my undergrad program in Mexico. Um, and that has allowed like, my living classmates in Mexico and um, all over the world to um, contribute to biology of genomes, uh, thanks to you. I'm not sure I'm the first from my undergrad here talking, but I am certain I'm not going to be the last, and I hope um, I'll be able to come back. So with that, um, I'll talk about uh, what we're doing at the Liber Institute for Brain Development. Um, I'm part of Andrew Jaffe's uh, data science team, and uh, we're working on uh, neuropsychiatric, neuropsychiatric disorders uh, because they uh, affect a large proportion of the population, and they affect the U.S. economy quite a bit. Um, and in the past 65 years, there haven't really been any changes on how we um, treat the symptoms of some of these uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. We're still like targeting the same DRT do, uh, blockade um, system. And in that same time, amount of time, like we went from Sputnik to like sending a car in space. Um, and so we heard from James Watson yesterday that like um, it's hard to work in this field, right? Um, and so at the Liber Institute, we, you know, we start from clinical genetics. Uh, one of the things that sets us apart is our large uh, human postmortem brain collection. We have over 2,000 brains, and we're doing a lot of functional assays on those brains, like genomics, trans transcriptomics, ideally to um, you know, find some uh, potential targets. And then we have researchers working on animal models, uh, cell models, and drug discovery. So um, sequencing is not cheap, right? Um, and um, so the Liber Institute partnered with like several uh, pharmaceuticals to then um, create this brain seq consortium that is looking at um, RNA seq. And in the first phase it was a poly A um, RNA seq on uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and it was around like uh, 400 plus samples. Um, I'm going to be talking about phase two, where like now we're looking with the ribo zero RNA seq data uh, and its two brain regions, the DLPFC and hippocampus. Um, and I, given where I'm standing, I have to uh, thank, um, um, you know, it would not be appropriate to not mention that um, this preprint now is, uh, has been accepted and we've allowed other people to read it thanks to BioArchive for the past 400 days uh, <laughs> and to share, share our advances and, uh, right? So, um, okay, BrainSeq phase two. Uh, this data set is a total of 900 RNA-seq samples from two brain regions, the LPFC, hippocampus. We have approximately the same number of samples for each of the brain regions in the adults and the prenatals. Um, and uh, we can further break this down by like the schizophrenia cases and the non-psychiatric controls. Um, something important to note here is that we don't really have any uh, uh, schizophrenia cases uh, that are uh, under age 18. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the nature of the data set will like guide some of the type of analysis that we'll be doing. Something that we're trying to do at the Liber Institute is we're trying to focus on being uh, conservative. So we're using like well-established methods. We're going to use some strict cutoffs. We'll use replication when possible. There's a, uh, an RNA quality degradation problem uh, that affects the case control analysis. We'll try to adjust for that. We'll avoid some potential back effects. And then we also have correlation at the individual level because for most of these individuals, we're looking at two brain regions. Um, and something else that we've done at the Liber Institute and with collaborators at Hopkins is uh, we are measuring in RNA seq uh, expression, not only at the gene level, but also at the exon level, um, exon exon junctions, and other methods like transcripts and express regions. Um, with this data set, we'll be able to do also some genotyping, look at expression over age, look at regional differences, um, and then also look at uh, differences by diagnosis status. So uh, our main RNA-seq processing steps involve a lot of um, um, established methods. Um, I'm not really going to go into deep, deep into them. I just want to highlight that uh, what we're doing um, um, is common to many other groups, but like step seven there is we're really trying to create um, analysis-ready objects. and so. Uh, we really like this um, type of objects from the bioconductor uh, community, the range summarized experiment. Um, and we're working with a company in Mexico to 
take our pipeline that is like customized for our computers to actually use it in other places. Um, the first step is like we have all this um, expression data and then we use all the 900 samples to like establish some expression cutoffs. Here we're using some breakpoint estimation to find like a stable point um, instead of like choosing an arbitrary cutoff. Um, so uh, for at the gene level, for example, we use a, a mean cutoff of 0.25 at the RPKM. The three models that I'm going to be talking about are the three biological questions that we're trying to answer with this data set. We're looking at uh, region-specific differences in either the adults or the prenatal samples. Um, this is only in the controls. Um, then uh, we're also going to look at developmental changes and how these changes are, um, how the two brain regions are different. Um, and then we will also ultimately do the, the case control analysis um, also um, comparing a little bit the, the two brain regions. Um, in like pseudo math, these models translate to, uh, first we're looking at, uh, at a region uh, difference, as, um, adjusting for some um, um, demographics and um, technical uh, variables. In the development, we're looking at a, a spline model where we're looking at an interaction between the region and the different spline terms. Um, and in the case control analysis, we're looking at differences by diagnosis status, adjusting for several variables. So uh, the first model here um, is the, the region-specific model. We use BrainSpan, which is an external data set for replication. And on the left, I'm showing the replication, which is kind of low um, across different p-values on the x-axis. Um, and uh, you, you can really see that, well, we needed this replication data set because on the right, we have the volcano plot, but there are, um, uh, there's a lot of signal in this model. Um, and on the top row is the, the signal that didn't replicate. On the bottom row is the, the signal that did replicate. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to be conservative here, um, and that will help us guide our results. Um, what we find here is that we don't really see any differential expression at the gene level um, in the prenatal samples um, between the two brain regions. Um, but, uh, in the, in the adults, we do see a lot of differential expression. We have over like 1,600 genes there, um, differentially expressed. And um, for all these plots, I'm gonna be showing you Venn diagrams where I show you the results at the gene level, but also at the exon level and the exon exon junction analysis. So um, just some examples here. At the prenatal, we see this gene, uh, CHCHD10, uh, to be differentially expressed between the two brain regions. And this, brain, this gene, we know that um, if, it's, if it has some mutations, it can lead to some serious uh, disorders. Um, and on the right here, we have GABRQ, uh, which is differentially expressed in adults between the two brain regions, and it's like one of the main um, um, neurotransmitters, major inhibitory neurotransmitter. And that makes sense because you know, when we look at gene ontology and uh, what, are, what are the rich terms, at either the gene exon or exon exon junction level, we really see that the differences between these two brain regions in the adults uh, comes down to um, um, neurogenesis and neuronal differentiation. So um, we also have some methylation data set um, worked by Steven Semek, who's here in the crowd. Um, and um, what we see in the methylation data is we estimate uh, cell type uh, proportions using uh, you know, different age genes, we see that we, we, there's not that much of a difference in the prenatal stage, but there's a big difference between them uh, as they age, right? between, these two, between these two brain regions. So um, um, that you know, coincides with the, with the previous results that we just saw, where we don't really see uh, RNA expression differ differences in the prenatal stage, but we do see like, large differences um, in the adult stage. And when we do a developmental analysis, like and looking for this um, interaction between the age splines and uh, region, we find a lot of results, um, and that could be driven by, by these like changing in cell composition. Um, um, and there's like a, a little bit over, a little bit less than 6,000 genes that are differentially expressed across all three feature types. Um, and an example gene of this is uh, GRBRD. Uh, 
where here we, you know, our prenatal samples are from the second trimester. Um, and uh, this is what the raw data would look like, but to observe what the actual model is visualizing, we regress out some covariates. And this model, what it's testing is for like a change in, um, in, um, in, um, in um, the beta term in the, in the slope um, at any of these age different, at any of these age beans. So here really we see a difference in uh, the zero to one age group. We also see a difference in the prenatal group. Um, so, okay, so far we have differences um, um, in the age um, samples between um, DLPFC and hippocampus. We also find a lot of differences uh, across development. Um, but the next main thing is uh, the case control analysis. And for that, we had, we're using a method that was developed by Andrew Jaffe uh, called the QSVA workflow, which is a bit complicated. And so we have our brain seq data over here on the right. Um, but what we did for this method is we generated a new data set, a degradation data set, where we um, take a couple of brains, um, 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 take the, you know, Get, get the slices of the brain regions we're looking at, leave them on the bench, and then measure them across time so we can get uh, genes that are associated with degradation. And you can compare the degradation signal to the actual diagnosis signal. And you use a naive model where you're just looking at a diagnosis signal. You get like thousands of genes that are differentially expressed. And that's because there's a confounding between degradation and diagnosis. And remember, we're working with uh, human postmortem brains. And there's a, there's, a, there's a difference in post-mortem post interval between um, our cases and controls. So this method, what it does is we find regions of the genome that are associated with degradation. Uh, once we find those regions, we quantify them in, in BrainSeq phase two. Then we like uh, um, a, uh, compute PCs on that uh, reduced matrix, and we determine the number of PCs we should be adjusting for using the SVA bioconductor package. And then that way we end up with our QSVs that we can use in our, um, as adjustment covariates in our model. So graphically, we started from this model, that naive diagnosis model, um, and then uh, uh, that has like 0.4 correlation between the de degradation signal and the uh, uh, diagnosis full chain signal. If we use a model that you know, uses all, all the variables that we know are related to um, quality, uh, we definitely improve the results. And the final model where we're using the cross-region QSVA, we end up with like a small list of genes that are differentially expressed, but where we're like, you know, um, more, um, um, we're ready to bet that um, these are likely to be differentially expressions. They're, so we've, re um, we've greatly reduced um, our false positives. And so some of the results that we see here is that, um, if we compare the DLPFC results and the uh, hippocampus brain regions, um, and here I'm separating the differential expression genes between those that have higher expression in controls than, than schizophrenia um, uh, or um, higher expression in schizophrenia cases than non-psychiatric controls, we see that they don't overlap much, these two brain regions. And we can see that again if we like look at the top 400 differential express genes from uh, hippocampus and compare them to DLPFC which is what I'm doing here on the bottom left. Um, and you can see that you know, there's some genes there that don't really agree between the two brain regions. We actually did it like both ways, then we ended up with a square. Um, uh, but if we look at DLPFC and compare it to the DLPFC from BrainSeq phase one, we do see higher agreement. And um, so um, remember uh, BrainSeq phase one is a poly-A analysis. Uh, BrainSeq phase two is uh, ribosome. So this tells us that we're, there's really some differences between the two brain regions um, and on, on the left and then on the right that we're like, you know, on the right track between uh, um, our two different projects. The, and um, if we look at uh, um, gene ontology, um, we only find um, ontology terms that are enriched on the genes that have higher expression in the non psychiatric controls and the schizophrenia cases for both brain regions. And um, they overlap a bit, and they overlap in terms that are related to the immune process. So we see like leukocyte um, migration, lymphocyte migration, and neutrophil chemotaxis. 
um, terms. Um, we've also, I mentioned that we have also some genotype data, so we also looked at EKTLs, and we get like thousands, millions of EKTLs when we look at the gene exon and exon exon junction level. Um, um, and uh, this is an example of one that is, uh, this, this um, SNP is from the PGC2 risk alleles, and we, we see it both at the junction level and also at the transcript level. Uh, and it has been like, that same um, uh, gene uh, has been like uh, associated with a different SNP by, by Watanabe and Al. Um, and this it goes in line with what we observed previously in the BrainSeq phase one project where we also found a lot of EKTLs um, at, uh, in the LPFC. Uh, but we also find some, not that many, but some um, region dependent EKTLs. That, that is that there are, there are an EKTL in one brain region but not in the other. Um, and we're planning on updating our EQTL browser soon, so um, you'll be able to see all the lists. And we, we really try to include every single association, even if, it, if, the, even if the p value is not um, um, very small, because um, some users are interested in like, just seeing, like, okay, what was the actual p value, right? Like, if we tested it or not. So, in, in summary, uh, we've used conservative methods uh, to reduce the false positives as much as possible. Um, I know there's some other methods from, the, from this conference that we might you know, be interested in using. Um, quantify, we quantify expression at different levels. We see like widespread, widespread differences between these two brain regions. We adapted this, the QSVA framework for two brain regions. There's regional specificity in the case control effects. And this means that potentially for any um, therapies, they would need to target just ex the expression, let's say, on, on one brain region, let's say the LPFC and not hippocampus. Um, and in progress, we want to submit a preprint now. I mean, now that phase one is accepted, we can do phase two. Uh, but, uh, and hopefully we'll you know, get to a journal that allows us to cite all the methods we need to cite. <laughs> because, uh, and um, thank you. I just want to um, acknowledge the people, my co-authors. Um, I also want to highlight that Amy, my student, my MPH student, um, is looking for jobs in New York. Um, there were other posters by our team here. Um, I want to thank the lab members, the funding, uh, and at the Andrew Jaffe lab, we're hiring. There's multiple positions open. And personally, I'm, um, I'm very proud of how like, diverse, welcoming, and uh, supportive our team is. Um, so thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, right back there. Hi. Hello. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I want to ask you, do you have post-mortem intervals for these post-mortem brains? And if you, do you see any effect of them or use them as covariates? So we don't have it for, like, we have estimated post-mortem intervals, right? We don't have precise ones because, um, 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 I mean, sadly, like um, a lot of the um, a lot of the schizophrenia cases, um, um, these individuals they die by suicide sometimes, and it might not it might take a couple of days to find them. Okay. And Thank like you. like the the um, the controls are normally um, we have we normally have more precise PMIs for them. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about the. It seemed like consistently there was distressingly little overlap in sometimes the differential expressed exon junction and gene results, which I guess is, I think that's, people are aware of that. The thing I'm slightly confused is that there seem to often be cases where you'd have a gene uh, result but not exon, but it, my, intuitively I would have thought that you would see it in the exon data if you see it in the gene data. Yeah, so um, there's a great um, um, article by um, Michael Love and Charlotte Sonanson in F1000 Research where they show that uh, you can have differential gene expression or you can have differential transcript expression. And there, there are cases where the gene might be, say, the same. But like, uh, <laughs> can I get it right? <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, but yeah, like the gene might stay the same overall, but like if there's an isoform, two isoforms that change, right? And the next one that is unique to one of those isoforms could change. But I guess I was thinking of the ones where you have the gene, you have a, you have a gene result, but no exon result. Whereas it feels like, yeah. Be. So that can happen because at the gene level, uh, um, 
if it's a gene that doesn't have that much um, reads assigned to it, oh, okay. so we, we're able to measure it there, and maybe at the exon level, we okay. don't have that enough sense. to measure it there. Especially, that happens especially for the exon exon junctions. Yeah. So all these like methods are complementary. The gene and the exon are annotation based. The, the um, exon exon junction is not annotation based. So we can even look at unannotated junctions yeah. there. Okay, uh, well, please join me in thanking all of the speakers in this last great session. Thank you.